Good evening, everybody. Let's get started. Let's talk about lab. Pre-lab 10 is not due this Friday. I had that on the schedule, but I removed it. Um, this lab is going to be a little different. It's going to be a, essentially a, a, a two-week lab um, with some design responsibilities. It won't be too hard, but I'll explain more about that on, on Wednesday. <clears throat> but don't worry about a pre-lab 10 due this, uh, well, actually this Thursday, so there's no pre-lab due. Uh, but lab 10 will be held this week, so plan on attending your lab session on Friday. Also note that the quiz is posted, so there is a quiz due uh, 1120, November 20th, so take a look at that. That's up there. Also remember, I'm unable to add everybody automatically to new Slack channels. So if you get on Slack and you don't see channels relevant to the homework you think that should be up there, uh, do a search on the channel or, or look at the list of channels and um, you'll, you'll have to add it yourself because I am unable. So I will have office hours right after class and the TAs are also uh, posted on the website. And if you have a question during class, uh, be sure and unmute or shoot me a chat. Um, and then unmute when I miss your chat. Otherwise, please stay muted so that uh, we can keep the background noise low. So here is, uh, up on the screen right now, the course roadmap. So we have really made good progress through all of these topics, through the circuits course, circuits part of the course, and the electronics part of the course. And we started into the digital circuits and, and digital logic part of the course. So today we're actually going to finish up digital logic, talk a little bit about that, and transition into microcontrollers. So that's coming up today. Question in chat. Let's see, is there also no homework due this week? Let's see, there is no homework due. That's right, so if, uh, homework seven was your most recent one due, and homework eight is not due this week because we have to finish up some work on microcontrollers first. Okay, so <clears throat> I started uh, talking last time about connecting electronics uh, transistors specifically to math operations, right? So somehow our computers do math and they're made out of transistors. So I'm going to make a very, uh, very long leap uh, from transistors to math operations, but I do I do want to show you, for example, that that with transistors you can create these combinatorial logic gates that we've been talking about, and using gates I'd like to show you how well we add numbers in in uh, in computers. So let's talk about going from transistors to gates first. So here is uh, an OR gate. So on, on the uh, left, you see two inputs, A and B. Those are two logical inputs. Uh, at, at the top, you see a power supply that the little circle should be connected right there. But that's a, uh, a power supply, in this case, six volts, applied to the collectors of these transistors. And then the output is on the, the right uh, at the out node. And there's a resistor down here. So uh, imagine that when you apply a voltage, for example, to to logical input A, let's say you apply five volts or six volt volts, or whatever voltage is needed in order to saturate this transistor. So this transistor is either going to be saturated or in, in cutoff, right? And when it's saturated, it's like a closed switch. And when the transistor is in cutoff, it's like an open switch. So essentially, you have two switches here that connect six volts to the output in some way. So Let's suppose that A is zero and B is zero. So both transistors are in cut in cutoff, right? They're open switches. So there's nothing connecting the six volt supply to the output. Uh, but what there is, is this 4.7 K ohm resistor that is connecting the output uh, to ground. So the output would be zero volts when A and B are, are zero. And so uh, when you, and since there's no current flowing through that 4.7 K ohm resistor, right, because these transistors are in cutoff, uh, there's no voltage drop across that resistor by, by Ohm's law. If we take either one of these inputs, or, or both in fact, uh, 
and make them a high value, a logical high, then one or both of these transistors goes into saturation, which means it's a closed switch. And one or both of them will connect that six volt supply to the output. And yeah, you'll have six volts across that 4.7 K ohm resistor. You'd have, you know, a little more than a milliamp flowing down through that resistor. But the output will be really close to six volts, right? So we, we talk about the saturation voltage, VCE saturation being 0.2 volts. So the output would be 5.8 volts ish. <clears throat> In reality, the VCE is probably smaller than 0.2. So you get approximately six volts at the output. But this implements the truth table of an OR gate, right? If either input is true or both, then you get a high level at the output. If both inputs are zero, false, then you get a zero at the output. So that's how an OR gate is implemented with two transistors. We could take a look at an AND gate, right? You can kind of get the idea how, the, how this works here. Um, here we have two transistors, again, uh, with logical inputs A and B applied to their bases through a resistor and a six volt power supply. So uh, if these transistors are operating like switches, if either one of these switches, these transistors is uh, in, uh, in cutoff, no current flows. And so the output's connected to ground through a resistor. So the output would be low. Each, or I should say both, a and B would have to be high to saturate both of these transistors in order to connect six volts to the output, right? So this implements the, the uh, truth table of an AND gate, right? So let's, so, so you can imagine, you know, different gates being implemented this way, uh, but, but it's all done with transistors, typically either BJTs or nowadays uh, field effect transistors, but the principle is the same. Uh, professor? Yes. So it's the base currents then that act as the inputs for transistors? That's right. Yes, you have. So the base current controls the collector current. So the base current is what can saturate the transistor. Okay. And so in this case, um, for transistors to translate to gates in this way, then it's either cutoff or saturation, right? The off and on, that's what signifies it? That's right, yeah. This is using a transistor as a switch, as we called it. It's not acting like a linear amplifier, right? Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. thank you. Other questions on this? Okay, so I've taken you from transistors at least to a couple gates. Uh, let's go from uh, gates to math operations specifically an adder, a, a, a circuit that sums two numbers together. Let's first talk about what's called a half adder. So this half adder on the left takes two bits as input. So you're, you're adding, let's say, two binary numbers. Let's start with one, uh, the, you know, the, the least significant bit, the ones place of the, um, of, of, of the number you're trying to add. So let's add bit A and bit B. Well, so on the output is a sum bit, that's an S, and then there's a carry bit, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and so the, here are the inputs in the truth table, right, A and B, and let's concentrate on the sum bit, the S bit at the output. This gate that implements that is a, an XOR, and I call the XOR a modulo two adder. Um, and so I'll, I'll explain that in a second. It actually adds uh, two bits together and gives you the proper output for adding those two bits together, at least one of those, uh, one bit of the output. <clears throat> so if you add, let's say, let's say input A is zero, input B is zero, zero plus zero is, well, zero, right? That's, that's, from the truth table of the XOR gate. If A is one is B, and B is zero, S is zero, or S is one. One plus zero is one. If A is zero and B is one, zero plus one is one. So that's right. But then you look at this, right? What if you add one plus one together, the output is zero. What the heck's that, that all about? Well, remember one plus one is two. And so the, the, the 
bit right next to the radix is actually zero for that bit. And then you carry a one. That's what this carry bit is for. So if I look at adding one plus one, right? I add in binary one plus one is binary zero, carry the one. That's what this red one is. Add that to zero and zero and you get two. So you actually, when you add one plus one, you need two bits to represent the result. But that rightmost bit is a zero. So that's why when you look in the table, one plus one is zero. And then C is the carry bit that is going to go over to the next column of bits to add. Okay. <clears throat> so this carry bit has to go somewhere. It has to go to the, well, next stage in the bit adder. And so that's, that next stage is called a full adder. A full adder does this. It takes as inputs on the left an A and a B, right? Those are the, uh, th those would be the, the, the bits in the second column, the inputs there. And it also takes a carry input. So this carry in the half adder is an output that goes to the carry input of, of the next bit in line. And so I have a couple XOR gates and a couple AND gates and an OR gate here. And so, but but the main output for that one bit is is the uh, the S bit, the sum. So you could go down here and you'll see you'll you'll get the right the same result if I just look at A and B. Assume the carry is zero, right? If the carry is zero, zero plus zero is S is zero. If the carry is zero, zero plus one is one. One plus zero is one. One plus one is zero. Carry the one. So, so next, um, what if we have a carry input? That's what this bit is. So if you add zero plus zero plus one, you get a one at the sum bit, right? If you add zero plus one plus one, you get a zero as the sum bit and one as the carry out. Okay. Professor? Yes. Can you kind of explain a little bit more like what a half adder and what a full adder like actually means? Yeah, a half adder <clears throat> adds two bits together and outputs the sum of those bits and also a carry bit to bring to the next stage. A full adder actually takes in an input carry and outputs not only a sum, but, but, a, but a carry. That makes sense? Still kind of confused, honestly. <clears throat> What's what's confusing about it? So what is a carry bit and all that? Okay, so you see on the on the right here, uh, if I add so in binary one or in decimal one plus one is two, right? So in in binary, if I add one and one, I, my result has to be a I'll call it a binary two, right? One zero is a binary two. So that's what the um, the half adder does for its carry bit is, uh, you know, just like when you're adding numbers on paper, even in decimal, you add two numbers together. If you get two digits out of it, you you take that uh, second digit and you put it on top of the adjacent column, right? And so you're you're adding two numbers together. You're getting a sum, and then you're doing what's called carrying the the next digit over to the next column where it belongs because it's in the, uh, you know, it belongs with the, the, the next power of two. So why is the logical one plus one zero? <clears throat> why is logical one plus one zero? Okay, um, because that's the result of this column right here, right? One plus one is two, mm -hmm. and to represent a two, I need a zero in the rightmost bit. Okay, oh, okay, I got you. So, and then you know, so mm -hmm. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you can imagine also maybe a zero being to the left of this one where my mouse is, and maybe a zero being right here. So it would be one plus one is a zero, carry the one, and then add one plus zero plus zero, and you get a one here. Okay. So one plus one is two. And what differentiates a full adder from this? The full adder actually takes a carry as an input. 
So this half hour, if this half adder would be the rightmost bit in this add, the rest of the bits to the left of that rightmost bit um, have to take a carry input because there might be a carry from the from the from the from the bit just to the right of them. Right. So in other words, this red one right here, this red one has to go somewhere. And if I'm adding numbers, I've got to add actually three numbers together. One and where my mouse is, whatever number this is, plus where my mouse is, whatever number this is. I have three bits that have to be added. And that's this A, B, and carry in. Okay. So in the half adder section, is that C for outputs? Is that the carry? Right. The C is the carry okay. bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So what you wind up with is if you had, let's say, multiple uh, bits you had to add together, let's say a four bit word you had to have to add together, you'd have to have a half adder and then three full adders. And you'd look at the sum bits, the, the sum bits at the output, uh, you'd line up and th that would be your resulting sum. And you might say, well, what if the leftmost full adder has a carry that's equal to one? Well, then you're going to, you're not going to have the right answer. You're going to overflow your result. It's kind of like adding, you know, 99 plus two in, in decimal, 99 plus two, and trying to represent the result in two digits. You can't do it. 99 plus two is 101. So you'd have to have three digits to represent the result. Well, eventually you have to define how many digits you're going to have in binary or decimal to store your result. So, uh, so there are bounds on on the numbers you can add while getting an accurate result. Okay, so, so you could build these adders up to higher and higher levels of operations based on transistors. So if I can build gates out of transistors and I can build adders out of gates, well, then I can build adders out of transistors, right? So this is how you would implement an adder block on, on a chip with transistors. Okay, um, so let's do this. Let's uh, let's do a clicker problem. So grab your clickers or your clicker apps, and let's try this. Oh, what happened there? I think I'm pulling. Oh, there we go. Huh goes away when I move it. Anyway, um, so you see a circuit here, a transistor circuit, and you see input, you see output. Which logic gate is implemented here? And you might ask yourself this, so how many inputs does this circuit have, right? How many out, and it has one output, but it, it, it only has uh, one input on the left side. So that might be a, a hint on narrowing this down. Okay, so take another 20 seconds. Take a guess if you haven't answered already. Remember, you just have to answer during clickers. You don't have to get the right answer in order to get credit. And you only have to get, you only have to have responses during half of the sessions in order to get uh, full credit for that clicker homework score. All right, five seconds. And time. Okay, so uh, 
you know, one hint was there's only one input, so it, this can't be an OR gate um, because that would take two inputs. It cannot be an AND gate. The AND gate has two inputs. It could either be a buffer or an inverter. And so we didn't talk about a buffer, but a buffer actually has the output equals the input. And it's usually, you, you know, what good is that? Well, it's usually used uh, in a way there where a chip can take an input logical value and output the same logical value, but provide high current, okay? So to drive something. Um, so let's, let's take a look at this, what this means. Uh, if, let's take this one at a time, if the input is zero volts, right? Then that means that I have no base current and that the transistor is in cutoff. That means it's an open switch. So it's like this transistor is not even here. It's just an open, open component. So the output is connected to five volts through a 10K ohm resistor. But if I have little or no current um, out of the output, then there's little or no voltage drop across the 10K ohm resistor. So the output would be five volts. Okay, so if I put in zero volts, which is a zero, I get five volts or a one at the output. Okay, so this is pointing toward, well, this is, that just inverted the logical sense. Uh, I think it's an inverter, but let's try the input equal to five volts. So if I have five volts, it's a logical one. Um, this transistor is going to be saturated. For any logical or digital problem, you assume the transistors are operated either in cutoff or saturation. They're being used as switches. So if I have five volts applied to the input, the transistor is saturated. That means it's like a closed switch to ground. So at most you're gonna see about 0.2 volts at the output. So I have uh, five volts at the input resulting in about zero volts at the output. So I get a logical zero. So this circuit takes a logical zero input turns it into a logical one output, takes a logical one input, turns it into a logical zero output. So this is an inverter. Um, Professor, can you say again why uh, zero volts for the input gives you five volts at the output? Mm -hmm. Sure. So when, when I have zero volts at the input, that saturates this transistor. When the transistor is saturated, VCE equals mm, 0.2 volts, really close to zero. Oh wait, so you ask you ask when there's when there's zero volts or when there's five volts? When there's zero volts. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I messed up there. When you have zero volts at the input, this transistor is in cutoff. So, uh, there's no there's no base current, so there's no base current. Transistor is in cutoff. It's like this transistor's not even here. It's it's like an open switch. So if I have an open switch. Uh, where that transistor is, I have five volts connected to the output through a 10K ohm resistor, right? If there's very little current, and you typically assume that for logic circuits, you're not taking significant current out of an output. Um, if there's very little current, there's very little voltage drop, almost zero, across this 10K ohm resistor. So you can run a KVL equation uh, from ground minus five plus Vx, right? Vx is almost zero plus V output. You would find out that the output is about five volts. Okay, okay. so that, and that's because the transistor is like an open when it's- Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, when you have zero volts input, the transistor is an open. It is not conducting current. Yep. Okay, other questions on this? All right, so let's then continue on to microcontrollers. <clears throat> so you may have used microcontrollers in one of your earlier classes. I think some of the, the intro to engineering classes use Arduinos. Um, so if you've used an Arduino, you have used a microcontroller. First, I'd like to contrast microcontrollers to the logic integrated circuits that we, we've been working with for the last couple of days. So we talked about 
there are NAND gates, NOR gates, AND gates, OR gates, inverters, et cetera, that are built into these chips. Get my arrow here. Um, so these, you know, NAND gate, NOR gates, inverters, et cetera, those are combinatorial logic chips. I'm also showing another integrated circuit here. This is a counter. Now counters are interesting because they have memory. In other words, so what do they count? They usually count either rising edges or falling edges of digital signals. In other words, if a, if a signal goes from zero to one, the counter counts, it increments, right? And then it's going to, then the, maybe the input falls back down to zero. And then once that input rises from zero to one again, the counter increments. That's what counters typically do. They can do that on either rising edges or, or falling edges. Um, well, they have memory because they have to remember the last count. If I've counted up to five and then I get another rising edge to increment to six, I have to have remembered that I was at five, right? I need some kind of memory. So these chips are called, um, this type of logic is called sequential logic. So combinatorial logic I mentioned only operates on present inputs, on the present time inputs. Doesn't, they don't have memory. Counters and other sequential logic chips, they have memory. So they, they operate on present inputs as well as uh, history, historical inputs, past inputs. So, um, and we're not going to dig into counters too much, but I wanted to mention counters because it's just another kind of logic and something you might run into. So with, with combinatorial logic or sequential logic, each IC, each integrated circuit performs specific logic operations. And you put these logic operations together uh, using uh, uh, wires, right? If you want a, an inverter connected to a NAND gate, then you connect with a wire an inverter to an AND gate. Okay. Um, and then if you need a different type of logic function or you run out of gates on your current chip, then you have to add another IC. So if you've used, in this case, four NAND gates and you need another NAND gate, then uh, you have to add another chip to your circuit. So it gets bigger. So the advantages are they're inexpensive chips and they're pretty simple to use for just a few logic gates, right? If you have, I don't know, you know, four, five, six logic gates to implement a function, yeah, this, this would be good to use. Um, but the packaging is really large if you need a large amount of logic gates. If I need a thousand logic gates, you know, I can't put 200 chips on a, on a circuit board that's really small. So the packaging is fairly large. Um, so a large amount of space real estate is used. They're not easily reprogrammable. So once you have your circuit put together and you realize either you have to change the, the logic function or you have an error, uh, then you have to move wires to re so-called reprogram the circuit or get it to do something else. Okay, so they have their place. So microcontrollers and microprocessors are a bit different. So here is an example of a, this is a Texas Instruments uh, MSP430 microcontroller. Um, again, you used an Arduino, which is actually an Atmel microcontroller chip. You usually find these on boards when you use them. You either design the board or you, uh, you, know, you, you buy an eval board. You probably, if you've used an Arduino, you've used uh, kind of a, an eval board, a demonstration board. Um, and that, that chip is right here in the center uh, on this board. And so microcontrollers differ from those other logic chips in that they have software definable functions. So you're not wiring together gates, you're defining the functions and connecting things together in software. You use a PC to create that software and download the instructions uh, for the microcontroller into the microcontroller's memory. And because you're using bits in memory, instructions in memory and not wires on circuit boards and chips, you can fit a large number of logical and sequential and branching functions into one of these chips. 
So logic we talked about, um, you know, you can make decisions just like we did with Boolean logic, except software. We talked, oh, I just talked about sequential logic. You could Im implement counters in, in software. Branching functions are like if statements in MATLAB. So you can implement those in microcontrollers and obviously microprocessors. <clears throat> so uh, the difference between microcontrollers and microprocessors is, is generally this. Microcontrollers have more peripherals for the purpose of sensing and controlling um, external devices, but they're usually slower than microprocessors for computing. You know, for example, uh, your computer might be multiple gigahertz. Uh, we'll talk about what that means, but the clock runs, instructions get executed based on a clock that might run at, you know, one, two, three gigahertz, something like that. Um, microcontrollers typically run a lot slower. They, they, run at uh, usually megahertz speeds, like one megahertz, eight megahertz, maybe 16 megahertz. The really fast ones are maybe 70 megahertz, seven zero megahertz. And um, they're, they're not really meant for crunching numbers. They're meant for uh, sensing and controlling. So that's the major difference between microcontrollers and microprocessors. But but at their core, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. They both take software to program. They have memory. Uh, they, they usually microcontrollers are the only ones that have general purpose input and output, but uh, but they're very similar. Just usually used for different purposes. The advantages are it's really inexpensive and easy to implement numerous functions. They're reprogrammable with just software. They are. Uh, they are suited for sequential programming, so everything doesn't have to happen all at once. You can make a decision, and based on that decision, you can make another decision. Um, you can write loops that do m multiple things in sequences. So, and for their for their capabilities, they are in a very small package, meaning there's little space used, very small amount of room, small amount of real estate used on a circuit board. So the disadvantages are, well, they do require a software development environment uh, to program. That's not such a bad thing, but you know, if you only need one or two logical functions on a board, you're probably not going to use a microcontroller because it takes, as you see on the board above, it takes extra parts. It takes a clock oscillator and a, um, some other supporting circuits in order to run that microcontroller. And then you have to program it. And also they are slow compared to high speed logic gates. So there are logic gates. Let's suppose you have to make a decision to fire an airbag or even even faster. You have to make a, um, uh, you know, you're, you're building a radar system and you're sensing signals and you have to sense those signals within uh, nanoseconds, right? So you can do something. Well, um, microcontrollers are, are fairly slow. They operate, again, on sort of this microsecond, maybe hundreds of nanoseconds, maybe a hundred nanoseconds um, uh, time period. And logic gates can respond in you know, nanoseconds or faster. So they're, they're, they're a lot faster to use individual chips. So each has its place. Uh, professor? Yes. So practically like, what differentiates microprocessors and microcontrollers? Like, are they built any differently or is it just like these sort of um, software processing power definitions that differentiate them? I mean, primarily from a functional point of view, why, you know, your applications point of view, it's that the microcontrollers have what we call peripherals. They have general, lots of general purpose IO. And what that means is there are pins on the microcontroller that you can use to either program them to go to a high voltage or a low voltage, or you could read in from the, the outside world uh, is a high voltage or a low voltage applied to the pins. And so that's called, those are called ports. They have usually analog to digital converters built in. So you can even take analog signals into the microcontroller. Let's say, you know, the, um, the, the analog value from a, a load cell that's sensing weight. Um, and so th these peripherals are what differentiate 
uh, generally a microcontroller from a microprocessor. Um, a microprocessor, again, runs really fast. It does computations and it puts results in memory and to a video card so you can see it on the screen. So if you want to sense and control, you're probably going to use a microcontroller. If you want to crunch numbers and do video displays and run MATLAB, it's probably a microprocessor that you're using. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, this leads us to embedded systems. You'll hear that term, um, an embedded system or, or an embedded controller. So embedded systems have hardware and software that forms a component of some larger system usually, and it's expected to function without the need for uh, much human intervention. Uh, so an example is you know, your refrigerator. Your refrigerator, many of them, many appliances have some form of microcontroller in them. If they have a user interface, if they have a display, then they probably have some software running somewhere in there. It may be a microcontroller that is a true microcontroller, like a separate chip that they went out and they bought from Atmel or TI or, or microchip, or it may be a chip, like an application-specific application, application -specific chip that has a microcontroller all built into it. So either way, there's some kind of um, controller running uh, on hardware programmed by software that, that, that does some function, right, automatically. Um, now, you know, here's another distinction of an embedded systems processor is typically versus a microprocessor. This is another sort of microcontroller versus microprocessor. The processor of an embedded system supports operation of the product, but generally the processor itself is not the main reason for having the product, right? So your refrigerator, right? You don't, you don't really can compare your refrigerator to your neighbor's refrigerator and you have a, I don't know, you have a uh, one gigahertz processor refrigerator with 16 gigabytes RAM and your neighbor has two gigahertz but only has eight, you know, you, you don't do that. The processor and the memory is not the point of the, uh, the embedded system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so, you know, you care that uh, your refrigerator stays cold uh, stays at a constant temperature. You open the door, the light goes on. You leave the door open too long. There's some kind of uh, alarm that goes off. That's what you care about. You don't really care that there is a processor in there. Your computer, on the other hand, might be different. You kind of care that you have a fast processor because if you're running a, a a million loops in MATLAB, you don't you know you want an answer now. You don't want to wait and go have lunch and come back and get your answer. So the processor in your computer, the microprocessor, it's it, it, it sort of is the point of your computer, even for playing games or, or doing uh, video work, things like that. <clears throat> so you could think about what products have sense and control functions. They probably have either microcontroller hardware themselves, or again, some form of microcontroller that's, that's placed on a chip um, <clears throat> that does maybe a larger function. Some of these, some of these products like cell phones and, and uh, music devices, they, they, when you make a million of these things, like a 10 million chips, you probably go design your own chip and then you put um, what they call microcontroller IP there. You, you put the microcontroller uh, functionality on a chip that maybe does more than just what a microcontroller would do. But, but my point is I, I digress. Microcontrollers are the, the, the hardware portion that can run software and can sense and can control. There are a wide range of uh, microcontrollers available. You can buy microcontrollers with just a few pins. You can buy microcontrollers with more than 100 pins. And they do different things, right? You can, you can maybe program a whole vehicle controller into a large microcontroller and maybe make a thermostat out of a, a smart thermostat out of a small microcontroller. Um, Again, so contrast. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So is the microcontroller within the embedded system? Yeah, the, the microcontroller is usually a component of the embedded system. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. but 
<clears throat> but the, the whole system would be considered the hardware and the software. For example, if you had external analog to digital converters and you have software that runs a program, you have a microcontroller that is the brain of this, this uh, embedded system, that would all be considered the embedded system. Okay, so the microcontroller within the embedded system is what allows the embedded system to have sense and control functions? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and it's, support, it's supported by either internal or external peripherals. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and those peripherals are like um, the hardware needed to sense, like analog to digital converters, the hardware needed to control, maybe digital to analog converters, um, to communicate like like a USB interface or a, a you know an Ethernet Phi chip, uh, all of that would be put together on a board, and that would be an embedded system that would you know enable your that would work inside of your internet enabled refrigerator, for example. That's what the embedded system would be. <clears throat> so you could think of all sorts of consumer electronics, appliances, vehicle control, instrumentation, right? Dot, 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 just about everything out there um, that has a user interface, some kind of display, some kind of sense function or control function is, is a, uh, has, has a microcontroller in it. Okay. So let me show you an example of, of a, sy uh, a system that is a simple embedded system. It, this is a scale. So if you have, for example, a weight and you want to measure that weight, you need a device to do that. That's what this is. <clears throat> so you have on the left, there's some kind of uh, sensor. On the right, there's some kind of output. In this case, it's a, you know, a digital display, a liquid crystal display showing the weight. And then you might have also as inputs, uh, user interface inputs like, like the unit grams or ounces and setting the zero, tearing the scale, right? So let's start on, well, let's start at the microcontroller. The microcontroller's job is to <clears throat> run the software that makes this scale work. It's going to take inputs, it's going to provide outputs, and it's going to be the center, the brain of this useful function. So on the on the left, we have the weight, and it's on uh, some kind of sensor. Maybe it's a load cell, right? So <clears throat> we've talked about resistors and voltage dividers. This is actually a, a, a bridge. These are this is a resistive bridge, and what these do is they are able to measure a small change in resistance and output a small voltage. So the way this sensor weight sensor typically works is that as you apply a weight it bends it deflects the resistors a little bit and some resistors the resistance actually goes down and some actually go up as as you apply more weight okay so but the output is this small relatively small uh, voltage right here analog voltage and then you have an analog to digital converter let me skip over to this to the right of the amplifier the analog to digital converter, it converts, we talked about analog, an analog continuous voltage uh, to a digital value that can be read by the microcontroller. Sometimes this is built into the microcontroller and sometimes it's external to the microcontroller. Analog to digital converters usually have some big span of voltage for their input. If this is a five volt logic circuit, right, that, that analog to digital converter probably, its input probably spans from zero volts to five volts, right? That's a pretty big span compared to maybe just a few millivolts or maybe a couple tenths of a volt span out of the sensor. So you need some kind of amplifier in between so you get the most accurate measurement. And this is where your op amp uh, knowledge would come in. So you could build an amplifier that has maybe a times 10 gain or a times 20 gain to make this really small input voltage into a bigger output voltage to drive your analog to digital converter, right, to provide a value to the microcontroller that is proportional in some way to weight, right? 
The microcontroller also would take in some switch inputs, grams, ounces, or set to zero. For, so those are those are also digital inputs. Is the switch pressed or not? Right. Um, and so <clears throat> those would be inputs, and the output would be some kind of value that gets um, applied to a, an LCD controller. Now again, this LCD controller could be some logic or some software inside the microcontroller, or it might be external, and then and then the output would be logic levels, these voltage levels that either light up a segment or make a segment dark in these seven segment displays in order to show a number, right? So you go from, from weight to sensor, amplifier to condition the signal, analog to digital converter to, to make it readable, make that value readable by and processable by the microcontroller, some input and then an output. So that's, there's a, you know, this has many elements of an embedded system. Okay. So let's, let's talk about how that microcontroller works. Works. Let's dig inside of it. <clears throat> inside that microcontroller, there are these components. Uh, there's, there's the program memory, and this is where you actually store your program. When you download a program, it goes into program memory. And it lists a bunch of instructions in order for that uh, microcontroller to do. There's data memory. And so if you have variables in your program or intermediate results, that gets stored in, in data memory, right? You have input and output ports. This is the connection to the outside world. So uh, ones and zeros, highs and lows, voltages, right, happen at the, to the outside world. So those are your ports there. There's the central processing unit. So this is the brain of the microcontroller. It does math operations. It has registers for basic um, basic operations, comparing and and operating on on variables, on numbers, and it executes the instructions. It knows the codes for the instructions and what to do. It's synchronized with what's called a clock. So this clock is not a time of day clock. It's it's like a it's a it's a square wave, and every time. <clears throat> Uh, like a rising edge happens, it could be falling edge or both, but let's say a rising edge happens, the CPU does something. It executes either an instruction or part of an instruction. So everything is synchronized by the clock. So when someone says you have a, you know, eight megahertz microcontroller or a 1.2 gigahertz computer, that's this clock, right? That's the clock that is making everything synchronized and instructions are happening on edges of that clock. In between, we have the data bus. So the, the data bus um, and, and the address bus, what they do is they are the connections. They are usually essentially parallel wires that connect between um, all of these major components. And it's, it's a shared resource. So this all has to be synchronized by the CPU <clears throat> and, uh, and addresses are applied to go, let's say, look in a certain part of memory to find a number and then that number is applied to the data bus so the CPU can get that number for let's say the variable. So, so it might happen like this. Let's suppose you, you've programmed in something into your program memory in your microcontroller. You turn on your microcontroller, you power it up. And so what happens is the CPU goes and looks, it's, it's program counter starts at zero and it goes and looks at, well, what's my first instruction? So it goes out here to program mem memory it gets its first instruction, and that instruction might be add two numbers together, add two variables together, and those variables are located in this data memory here. So the CPU would say, okay, I got that add instruction, now I'm going to go out into a certain address into data memory, and I'm going to grab a number. I'm going to pull that number in, I'm going to put it into one of my registers, which is temporary storage for numbers. And then it says, okay, I need a second number to add. It goes out into data memory to find some other uh, some other number out of uh, at some certain address and pulls it back into its register, another register. It performs an add operation, right? Using circuits, probably like what we looked at uh, earlier, right? To add numbers together. It puts the result into a third register and then it goes and it stores, let's say, you know, C equals A plus B. It finds the, the memory location in data memory to go put that result. And there you have it. You have, you know, A is in data memory, B is in data memory. And now after the instruction is executed, 
see the sum is in data memory. Okay, and all that transferred over the, the, the buses um, and the operation is performed by the CPU. And all those things I described happen synchronously with, with the clock. If you wanna control or send something from the outside world, that's what these uh, input and output ports are. So I could say, turn one of the pins, change one of the pins of the microcontroller to be five volts or change it to be zero volts. Um, you know, so logical one or logical zero. That can all be controlled by your program and program memory and then the CPU executes that. You can also read in values from the outside world. Okay, all right, so I, I think I've hit the wall here on time for today's lecture. Um, so in closing, uh, pre-lab 10 is not due this week. You will have lab 10, so, so get with your TAs at your lab section this Friday. You'll find out more then. Uh, there is a quiz posted. It's due November 20th, so take a look at that. And thanks for joining class. So I hope it's working out well. Let me know if anything is not working out well so I can try to fix it. And um, I will see you next time.